All right, so today, Wednesday morning, we're starting off on number 26. This is, a remember, a calculator portion of the test, and it's a, it's a geometry question. So it's the surface area of a cube is represented by this, where A is a positive constant. Which of the following gives a perimeter of one face of the cube? So be careful. They're asking for something kind of weird here at the end of the question. Um, I'm not going to bother trying to draw you a cube, but the idea is a cube would have a square base, um, and then it has six sides, right? So surface area would be like six times each of the faces. And if it's a cube, they're indicating that it's a square. So um, right here, the area of the square would be side squared. So apparently the sides of our square are represented as A over 4. So if you want to draw yourself, that's supposed to be a square, by the way. <laughs> Uh, a little square with A over 4 as all of its sides, well, the perimeter of that would be adding them all together, so it would be A. Boom! So that wasn't really too bad of a question. I was expecting worse this far into the test, because you notice we're almost to the end of the section, right? So everyone gets a little leery when they get to the end of the sections because they figure this is where all the horrible questions show up, and that's not really true. Um, this one, I was limited by my fact of, like, I can't draw, <laughs> but... Um, you could draw, you could probably get a little easier answer on that if you were stuck. All right, number 27 is a good question about a mean. And this is a very typical question for means on the SAT because they're not going to typically just say, like, here's a list of data, find the average. It's too simple for the SAT. So they're going to give you kind of a, a halfway done question. So the mean score of eight players in a basketball game is 14.5. So notice what they didn't tell you was, like, all of the players' scores, if you add them together, they didn't tell you that part. Um, but if you average them, remember mean means to average, you would divide it by the eight players and you'd get an answer of 14.5. So I'm going to leave that set up for a moment. Grab that test number five, Nick. Test number five on that table and also test number seven. So then there's another clue that says if you, if you remove the highest score from all the players or from their team, then the mean is going to change, obviously. Now you only have seven players and the mean is only going to be a 12. So when you add up all of those seven players, divide by seven, get an average of 12. So if I think of this like a, an algebra problem, if I want to figure out what these little boxes are, that's going to help us out. So we're going to cross multiply. We're going to multiply by eight over here. And we're going to multiply by seven over here. Luckily, this is a calculator question because at this point in my life, I'm really tired if I'm taking the test in its entirety. So quick calculations from you guys. Can someone tell me what 14.5 times eight is? 116. So this is 116, and then 7 times 12 is 84. And the question is, because that's the really important part, what is the highest score? Well, remember, the difference between the red black box and the blue box would be that we took out the highest score to get that other number. So just find the difference, which would be 32, I think. Great. That's a very typical question on the SAT. I've seen that almost exact question show up almost on every test. It's not always about basketball players, but it's a, a shifting average where they take away one of the numbers, the highest, lowest, whatever the difference is. All right, 28. Oh, man, we're almost done. And then we get to look at another one. All right, 28. Um, this is a graph. Clearly, it's a graph of a line. We have f of x, which is drawn. And then we got to read through for all the clues. So it says the slope of the graph of a linear function g. So some mystery function here is 4 times the slope of f. So let's start with that clue. If you guys could figure out the slope of f, then we could quick multiply it by 4 to find the slope of g. So slope, whoops, meaning rise over run, looks to me like the slope of f is up 1 over 2. So if I were to multiply this by 4, that means the slope of this mystery function g is 2. So keep that clue. It's not our answer, but that's part of our next step. Now it says the graph for function g passes through the point 0, negative 4. That's an amazing clue. Does anyone recognize what this clue is? We're on test number 5. Okay. Um, when they give you an ordered pair where x equals 0, what is that for a line? That's the y-intercept, yeah. So that means function g which you can call g of x if you like, or just call it y equals, has a slope of 2, we just found, with a y-intercept at negative 4. We just found g, y'all. Now what do they want me to do? 
They want me to plug in 9 into function g. So, plugging in a 9 right there. And all of a sudden we have a nice question. 18 minus 4 is 14. That's a great coordinate geometry question. What, like as a math teacher, what I like about it is it hit a few different concepts. It hit slope, it hit the idea of y-intercept, and it hit function evaluation. Um, as a math student, you're probably less excited about that. All right, guys. Oh, yes. I promised you there'd be a circle on your SAT test. And in fact, I wouldn't be shocked if you see two circle questions on your SAT test. They're becoming more prevalent as the years go on. Um, this is definitely a circle question. It says right here, you have a circle in the XY coordinate plane. Everybody from Algebra 2 through pre-calculus, y'all have seen this, that we have to complete the square in order to figure out the center of the circle. However, remember, I'm on a time crunch. I don't think I have to finish completing the square in this question. So let's look at, let's start with the x's. So if I, woo, that's right here. If I take the x's, normally what I would have done is put the blank, and then after I filled out the blank, my next step would have been to write it as factors. But do you guys see what I'm going with here? I don't think we need to, to finish. They don't want the radius, they just want the center. So who cares what you put in the blank? You remember that quick way to get down to the factorization? You just use the x, and then you take half of this middle term. So instead of positive 20, we're going to use the factor of positive 10. And then similarly for the y's, you know, I would have, if I did the whole problem, I would have had plus 16y plus blank. I would have had blanks on both sides. It would have been a good mess. Um, but if I shift this down into the factored form, this would have factored into y plus half of this would have been 8. So one more thing you got to be careful about. Remember, in circle formula, you have built-in negatives. So where's the center location? Negative 10 and negative 8. Do you notice that guy right there? That is the most likely answer of a child getting it kind of right but really wrong. And it's not a coincidence that it's sitting right next to the other one, okay? Um, this is for the child who didn't know to, to go have these when they went to go write the factor. Now, some of you feel very icky right now because I didn't finish the problem. You're like, she didn't do the blanks. She didn't balance it. Did I have to? No, because if I don't need the radius, I don't have to do all that work. But if you took the time to finish the problem and find the entirety of the circle because it made you feel better, that's okay. Um, you're just going to, every, you know, 12 seconds that you waste on a question just takes away from another question. But if you feel like you're a fast test taker and you're not going to run out of time, or if this just makes you feel like, I don't really like skipping steps, I'm not going to do that, that's okay. Your idea is to get through this test and feel comfortable when you're done with it. Oh, this is a great question. They want to know which of the following is equivalent to that equation. So there's two ways to approach this. The first way is to be a master of factoring formulas, and the second way is to be a master of foiling. So decide who you are. If you're very good at factoring, you should be able to look at your choices and tell me which one's right. And if you're not so great at factoring, if that's not your forte, then you just quickly distribute these back together and see who works. Um, are you noticing that these three patterns all kind of look similar? They have that plus minus good twin evil twin factor thing going on? Yep. So they're trying to lead you towards what's called the difference of squares factoring pattern. So the way the difference of squares pattern works, do you remember how this guy works? Is you take the square root of each term Come on, pen. Any day now. You take the square root of each term, and then when you go to write them into factors, you make one of the factors a plus and one of the factors a minus. So obviously the first terms are x and x, but the square root of a is simply that. It's just the square root of a. So do you see your answer? The choice B. And that would have finished our test. Because remember, those of us who weren't with us earlier in the week, um, when we hit a test section, we start on the gridded response at the end of your test, and then you come back to multiple choice. Someone reiterate for me, for my friends who weren't here, why do we do that? Why do we skip ahead to number 31 on this test before we hit number one? Yeah, because in the very likely event that we run out of time at the end of this test, we at least stand a chance of guessing and being correct. You're not going to be able to guess gridded response effectively. You have such a slim chance of guessing the right answers, it's not worth your time. All right, so finally... Three days later, we finished a test. All right, I've been blabbing a lot. I, I was a little alarmed. I went to go post the video from last night, for instance, because after school we have more time available. And we didn't get through a ton of questions. And I was like, wow, that took me like 45 minutes. So I went and I reviewed like my video and I just, I talked a lot. Obviously, I'm not going to be talking to you during your SAT test. So 
never fear. Um, but I do want you guys to know that it is really, really likely that you will run out and have to guess, run out of time and have to guess on some questions. Um, Algebra 2 students, currently with your math curriculum under your belt, you should be finding yourself guessing, you know, maybe five questions on each test. So five on the no calculator maybe and five on the calculator. Um, there tend to be easier questions on the calculator section that are like doable for the majority of people. The no calculator section has some stinkers on there for sure. So if you find yourself like percentage wise, like, man, I feel like I guessed a little more on the, the non-calculator one. That's true to form. Those are hard questions. They're hard. Plus the fact that you don't have a calculator, it's like your binky. Like they took it away from you, you know? Um, so we're going to look at test seven next. This is the same test that you guys may have taken on that Saturday practice test day. And so I know some of you have already looked at these questions. Let's just look at them with fresh eyes and see what we would have done. So we, our teacher who's in our room uh, is going to tell you to, you know, turn the page, you begin testing, and they'll write on the board, you know, you have, I always forget this one, you have 25 minutes to complete the next 20 questions, right? So the no calculator test right now, so go ahead and put those calculators off to the side so you're not tempted. Never read the instructions during the test and never read through the formula sheet, because guess what, guys, it's the same formula sheet you get every single time. So familiarize yourself with all the instructions and the formulas before the test day on Tuesday. The formula sheets, I mean, it's fine. It's, it's not great. It's better than nothing, I guess. All right, so I open the page. Here's number one. Is this where I start? No. I go forward. I think it's number 16. There we go. So there's directions for how to fill in girded response. That's all great, but this is not our first rodeo. We know how this works, right? And if at any point you guys are curious, like, oh, how else could I answer? Like, I'll try to go over what SAT said they would accept as other answers on here as well. All right, so we're going to start on number 16. And we're going to start with a really wonderful equation. 2x plus 8 equals 16. They want to know the value of x plus 4. So if you're like a little robot Algebra 2 student, you find x and then you go add 4 to it at the end. But does anybody see something kind of awesome? If you don't, it's okay. What if you divided everything here by 2? You'd get x plus 4 equals 8. I'm done. It's just a little math teacher trick. When they ask a weird question, like instead of saying what is x, if they say what is 2x plus 3, what that probably means is somewhere in your math work, 2x plus 3 shows up in your steps. So it's not like they're trying to be intentionally odd and strange. I mean, they are, let's be honest. Uh, if they just said find x, we'd all be fine. But if you guys went ahead and you solved for x and you got x equals 4 and then you went back and added 4 to it, you'd still get x, uh, x plus 4 equals 8, so it's not a big deal. So on your gridded response bubbles, you would do an 8 and you'd bubble in the 8. You guys know how that works. Um, remember, 8 can go anywhere in the boxes, but this is not a moment to be weird, so maybe just put 8 in the first box. Make sure you fill in the box and the bubble when you're filling out those answer sheets. Am I on the right test? Okay. <laughs> um, test 7 should be like the third page or something. Wait, what? Oh, yeah, because they're not starting at 1, because it's a whole test. I got you. It's like 41. That's crazy. Are you on test 7, Leo? Look at the front. It'll say test 7 on the front. If it says 5, you're on the wrong one. Okay, so back on the... back. It is test 7? No. Okay, on the, on the table. All right, 17. Clearly 17 is a geometry question, right? I can sniff out a geometry question with the best of them. Um, they want to know... Usually the first thing I do on these questions is I put like a question mark or an X somewhere on what they ask for. So they want to know the measure of angle QMR. So where's Q? QMR. They want me to figure out this angle right down here. Okay. So there's some other clues in here that they have not marked up on your paper. So it says, and by the way, they never tell you that the pictures are drawn to scale because they kind of get in trouble if they do that, but they are relatively drawn to scale. Even if they put a little note that says this is not drawn to scale, they're relatively drawn to scale. So if you're just flat out guessing, like just remember, use the picture for a little guidance. Um, where are we at here? NP, this guy, is equal to PQ. So we got a little congruence going on here. And, oops, I said, yes, MP, this guy, is equal to this guy. Probably would have guessed that based on the picture anyways, but they did have to tell you in order to get this question right. All right, guys, anyone have a thought? 
I'm on the wrong test too, Leo. Don't feel bad. I'm looking at my paper going, this guy, I hate my show. <laughs> there we go. Now, at no point do you have to spot out any theorems to me, guys. I'm not interested in your theorems today. But there should be some basic knowledge of shapes and lines and angles and things that are helpful. Like, for instance, how big is this angle right here? It's 120. Tell me why. Oh, that works. That was a fun way to do it. Yeah, I was just looking at the supplementary pair, but I'm with you. I like your way too. <laughs> so guys, we have a triangle here, and it's not just any triangle. We have an isosceles triangle. And what do triangles add up to? 180, and if you forgot that, that's actually on your formula sheet. But So if you have 180 and you take away that vertex angle of 120, that leaves you with 60 degrees. But both of these angles are 60 degrees, and they're equal because it's isosceles, because of those little congruencies on the side. Um, so divide that by 2, the answer is 30 degrees. You don't have to bubble in the degree symbol at any point. You would just bubble in 30. Move on. So we talked a lot about how geometry is on your test, but it's very sparse. And it's also, like, I can't really tell you what you're going to have because you have so few questions, they, they, they change them every year. So oftentimes we see those parallel line pictures. We'll see things that have to do with supplementary and vertical angles quite a bit. They'll throw some weird things about circles and arcs once in a while. And they really like to do the practical geometry questions. So like area, surface area, and volume. Those are kind of things that are inherent to your like life. I think you've done those questions on surface area, area, and volume since you were wee little ones. So they, they don't feel real bad about making you do a surface area or area question. Here's another geometry question. This one's a little more exciting. But I think there's something on your formula sheet that helps you out if you got stuck. Is there something about radians and degrees on your formula sheet? I feel like there was. I never look back at it, but I should do a better job. Yeah, so if you are like a little stuck with the radian measure. Now, my Algebra 2 kids, you have no idea what they're talking about. You haven't seen this yet. Uh, unfortunately, you're not going to see it till after your SAT test. But this is what I'm going to tell you. A circle can be measured as 360 degrees. But just like distance can be measured in different things, um, so can angles and degrees. So there's a measurement of angles called radians, and according to your formula sheet, it says the radians of an entire circle is equivalent to 2 pi radians. So if we have a 720 degree thing, what's the relationship here, guys? We have not just a single circle. 720 would be a whole other circle, right? So think about this, guys. If one circle is 2 pi and you do another one, what you got? 4 pi. So think here. a times pi equals 4 times pi. That means a must be 4. Now my pre-calc, my trig students, my kids who have already been through Algebra 2 or Honors Algebra 2, they're going, well, I did that a little differently. I did 720 times pi over 180 because that's what my teacher taught me how to convert. And then I figured it out that way. Hey, guess what answer you're going to get? The same thing. So the pi over 180 conversion that we use in pre-calc and trig and eventually Algebra 2, um, is just a reduced version of 360 over 2 pi. So, or 2 pi over 360. So, yes, very good. So, anytime you have to worry about converting radians, you can do that. Um, but since it's on your formula sheet for your purpose, because you haven't really had a lot of experience with this, think of a circle all the way around a circle as being equal to 2 pi. So, you could set up a ratio if you want of like 360 over 2 pi. And remember how proportions work as long as you keep the labels in the same spot. So if your degree measurement is up here and your radian measurement is down here, you could set up a proportion if you needed to, okay? Yeah. Yeah. And you won't, unfortunately, until like two weeks after your test. That's right. Google that. <laughs> um, actually, they. I know I personally have posted many a video. It's for ACT prep because they used to have some significant trig on their test. The SAT is going to have one trick problem, probably. So for my Algebra 2 kids and my pre calc kids who are going, oh, thank goodness. One trick question. I can handle that. Why do you guys hate trig so much? What's so, what trick ever do to you? All right. Don't answer that. I don't want to know. All right. Number nine. I'm not a huge fan of geometry either. I, I, you like geometry? I am not a fan. I am not a fan, man. I think it's because of my inherent lack of artistic ability is really like stopping me from enjoying it. Because whenever I have to draw something, it's like I just don't like drawing. 
I think is the issue. <laughs> All right, so we have a graph of a line. Have you noticed a lot of our graphs? Basically, two graphs. They've asked you quite a bit about lines and quadratics. Lines and quadratics, lines and quadratics, lines and quadratics. You need to be a master of the linear function, and you need to be a pretty good, not quite master, but pretty good at um, calculating things with quadratic functions, which you guys have had plenty of experience with, whether you believe it or not. Remember my uh, Fast Five videos? I have like 12 of them. And one of them just strictly talks, actually two of them, I think, talk about the linear functions, like the application parts of them versus the graphing parts of them. And then there's a couple of things on quadratics. One's just graphing quadratic functions, and one dives into like imaginary numbers and complex number systems. So those Fast Five videos, like I'm not trying to plug, I don't get any money for this, just they're really easy ways for kids to cram at the last minute. Like, I don't know, say Monday night when you're really freaked out and trying to study. That's the why I made them last year, actually. My kids told me, that they needed something quick, easy. They didn't want to watch a long video. And I said, okay, well, how many minutes are you willing to watch? And they said, under five. And I said, all right. So I made 12 five minute videos. <laughs> Joke's on them. All right, so here we go. <laughs> Point one four crosses the X axis at, oh, okay. Here we go. I think I need a sketch. You know, I'm really good at this, right? All right, passes through the point one four. Sure, sure, right here. I'm gonna pretend that's one four. And it crosses through the x-axis at 2, 0. So this ordered pair is supposed to be at 1, 4. This is at 2, 0. And if I connected the points here, I would get a line. A beautiful line. Yeah. I want to know the line crosses the y-axis at what value? So unfortunately, I graph really terrible. So I'm not going to be able to... I mean, I can make a guess. I know it's bigger than 4, right? Because it's going to be above 4 units up. Um, if you're really wonderful at graphing, maybe you could figure this out, but I think I'm going to have to calculate it, unfortunately. Guys, talk to me about slope. Slope would be really tremendously helpful here in this question. Slope, it, remember, is rise over run. So how far up versus how far over? Or if you're a formula baby, you can do y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. That is a formula. They don't have to, they don't make a big deal about formulas and memorization, but basic ones, linear formula, um, slope intercept, midpoint distance, those are things that you probably should have in your memory bank stored away. So y, it doesn't matter who's y2 and y1, just keep in the same order. So I'm going to go 0 minus 4 over 2 minus 1. I can tell from that line it's a negative slope, so keep that in mind. This gives me a slope of negative 4 over 1, which is negative 4. Now, you have a choice. Unfortunately for me, I don't have a choice. Remember how I graphed really poorly? My picture, I don't even think I can read it anymore. If you graph nicely, what you could do is you could travel with a slope of um, negative 4 and try to figure it out. What question are we on? Ooh, no, you can't. Is this a weird one? Why am I on the wrong test? Gosh, be golly. Get out of there, test. Oh, you know what? It does come out nice. Did anyone graph beautifully? You can already see where it crosses the y-axis. Remember, your slope is 4 over 1, so instead of traveling down 4, right 1, you guys could travel up 4 and left 1. Um, but here's what I'm going to do, guys. I know the slope. We just found the slope to be negative 4. And I'm trying to find b. Plug in your favorite ordered pair. Does anyone have a favorite ordered pair out of these two? 2, 0 sounds great. So we're going to plug in an x equals 2 and a y equals 0. Watch me go. Solve for b. Well, that's negative 8, right? So you're going to add 8. B equals 8. Now, any of your pictures, was it beautiful enough where you were like, yes, clearly it would have crossed at 8. Yeah, I know you. Of course yours was. It's probably colorful too. Uh, no, she's sticking with pencils so you can practice the right way. I like it. Um, that was a great basic coordinate geometry question. So graphing always helps in coordinate geometry land. Formulas obviously are integral to your success and your comfort. Um... Well, that doesn't look too bad. They want, hmm, this can be expressed in this form. So this is our first task. Get that thing to look like that. And then you're supposed to figure out what A plus B is at the end of the problem. We got this. Why are there parentheses around this? Well, but is there anything happening? But they're not even like terms. So like, this is what kids get freaked out. They're like, why are there parentheses? Because they felt like putting them, but do they do anything? Not really. So I'm just going to lose the parentheses. I'm definitely going to distribute this 10, though. 
So we have 7532 plus 100y squared plus 100y squared again minus 1100 zero, zero when you multiply that by 10. All right, get this to look like the blue thing. So add up your y squared terms. You have 200y squared. And then add up your constants. And do you remember that this is no calculator? Of course it is, because we should be able to subtract. All right, so if I combine that with a negative 1100, that would be, let's see, 2, 3, 4, 6. <laughs> 6, 4, 3, 2. Did I do that right? Oh, great. Okay, so now they want A plus B. Someone's very excited out there. Here's A. Here's B. Add those together. 6, 6, 3, 2. Please be the right answer. And it is. Now, you can imagine, if you were short for time, were you just going to guess 6,632? No, you weren't. That's why we do gridded response first. And that really wasn't a bad question. So having to guess on that one because I ran out of time would really kind of break my heart because that's one you should be getting right. All right, I think, oh, stop. You stop. All right. <laughs> so now, if we were live test taking, we don't stop, though. Don't, what do we do? We go back to number one. Let's see if we can squeeze in number one. I don't know what it is. Whoops. Oh, it's got words and stuff. We'll call, We'll start off on number one after school today. All right, I will post the video from today after school if you can't make it. I posted all of them. If you're not one of my kids or Mrs. Hoffbauer's kids, you can access them by just going to Abruzzo Math, my YouTube channel, and they're all posted as the recent posts. Oops.